it's, um, uh, it's a great honor uh, uh, for me to, uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, uh, Mervyn King as, uh, uh, as our speaker, our invited speaker at this, uh, uh, at this event. Um, uh, you know, I don't need to say that, uh, that, uh, that Mervyn does not need any introduction. Um, he doesn't. Uh, uh, you, know, you know much more uh, about him than, than, than the members of the shadow, uh, uh, all of you. I can assure you, I know what you know about him. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, but I, I, I thought I would, uh, I would hear an introduction just highlighting um, uh, my experience and what I've learned from, uh, from, from Mervyn interacting uh, with him over the, over the years and, and why I, I, I believe he's, uh, he's such a towering figure in the, uh, uh, in the world of, uh, of, of global central banking. And I had the luck of, of meeting him when I was uh, uh, a kid, an undergraduate at MIT, uh, uh, when uh, uh, Mervyn was, uh, was a renowned professor in public finance uh, visiting uh, Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, uh, I think for one or two years, I, I forget, for one year. Uh, it was an incredible uh, uh, experience. Uh, uh, and then it, 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 took, it took a while uh, to sink in when, uh, when he, uh, when he uh, decided to move into central banking, but uh, knowing him and, and knowing the intellectual power that he would bring to that, uh, uh, my, my immediate reaction is, boy, you know, this will elevate uh, the level of discussion in, uh, in central banking by an order of magnitude relative to what it had been. And this was really the beginning of, of a revolution, I think, we have, we have observed in, in trying to make uh, a central banking monetary policy more specifically, more systematic. Uh, Mervyn uh, uh, introduced uh, what uh, I consider to be state-of-the-art monetary policy at the Bank of England, uh, kept it honest uh, while he was, uh, he was there, when he became, uh, he was, uh, became governor. One of the most important things I associate with uh, 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 listening to his interventions uh, uh, over, over the years when he was at the bank uh, and, and later on is, uh, is being humble about what monetary policy can deliver, not try to change the operational framework of, of, of inflation targeting and uh, go away from the good elements of inflation targeting towards the fine-tuning inflation targeting, which some other central banks have, uh, have, uh, have done. So all, all of these are excellent elements to have. And then I had the luck to, to actually uh, interact with him uh, more frequently during the crisis. Uh, and you know, that's when you get to, to, to appreciate even more uh, the, uh, the depth of, uh, of analysis that uh, um, that, uh, that a policymaker can, uh, can make. Uh, 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 the, uh, the UK not being in the, uh, in the Euro area, um, we would uh, initially only meet infrequently. Uh, uh, both Mervyn and I were members of the General Council of the, of, of the ECB, where Mervyn would try not to come most of the time. This is, uh, <laughs> this is to show the appreciation of what the General Council of the ECB was, which is kind of this second-class meeting, uh, because the first-class meetings and Governing Council of the ECB, where all of the interesting stuff is happening, and, and people, uh, the governors from inside the Euro area can talk. But, you know, so this General Council, you know, so he was, with his absence, uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was making a very, very important point. But then during the crisis, uh, we, actually, uh, we actually had much, uh, much greater interactions at, uh, at, at other meetings, informal ECOFI meetings. And importantly, when the Europeans started to develop uh, other institutions uh, for, uh, for improving uh, the uh, regulatory framework, uh, one of the first things that was uh, created in, uh, in Europe was the uh, Euro European Systemic Risk Board, uh, where I had the opportunity to watch uh, 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 Mervyn uh, 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 operate as the vice chair of the, uh, of the institution. Uh, this, is, this is a position to which he was elected by his peers as opposed to the chair of the institution who is by default the president of the, uh, uh, of the ECB. Uh, again, I have to say, you know, I, I felt a little bit peculiar in that uh, in, in meetings of the steering committee, uh, 
um, maybe as part of the efficient running of the central bank during the crisis, more often than not, I, I would be seeing uh, Mervyn on, on a very large screen. Uh, all the rest of us would be around the table uh, and he would be there. But it doesn't matter. What really mattered was the quality of the, uh, of the interventions uh, uh, that, uh, that was so honest in identifying uh, problems, identifying many problems that could not be solved. Uh, that's Europe for you. Uh, uh, and of course, as you know, this was followed later on with the, uh, with the uh, honesty uh, we've seen in the constructive criticism uh, of, the, of the global financial order and of Europe uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Mervyn has been uh, communicating since uh, he has been freed to talk uh, after uh, stepping down from the, from the Bank of England. So you see, this is this is my personal angle. I will I, I will leave it uh, uh, here. Uh, 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 the floor is yours. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and Atanasios, thank you. You were much too generous. The real truth is that after my year teaching at MIT. The, the, the graduate students, very talented, we know that at MIT, but I could cope with that. But the undergraduates, like Atanasios and others, were so ferociously intelligent that I decided I'd better hop foot it back to London before I was exposed. Uh, it's a great privilege to be invited to speak to the Shadow Open Market Committee, uh, and particularly on a day when we are celebrating the career and contribution of Alan Meltzer. Alan was always someone who exhibited tremendous empathy to those of us who worked in institutions. Um, his directness of questioning, as Charlie mentioned earlier, was such that, that maybe that empathy wasn't always immediately obvious, <laughs> but it was genuine. And he always wanted to engage in a discussion to find out how institutions actually made decisions. And I think it's appropriate that today is dedicated to his memory. My text for today um, is the following extract from the latest published minutes of the August meeting of the FOMC. A number of participants noted that much of the analysis of inflation used in policymaking rested on a framework in which, for a given rate of expected inflation, the degree of upward pressure on prices and wages rose as aggregate demand for goods and services and employment of resources increased above long-run sustainable levels. Most participants thought that the framework remained valid. Now, this is the textbook model taught in macro courses in universities around the world, and which underlies the econometric forecasting models used in many central banks. Unfortunately, in my view, over-reliance <coughs> on this one particular model has led to three propositions about economic policy that I believe to be misleading. First, that the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates is the main obstacle which prevents a sustained recovery. Second, inflation below 2% but still positive is a major problem for policy. And third, that central banks are the only game in town. Now, for many years, it's been difficult to persuade the economics profession to put money back into monetary economics. The position has deteriorated. It's now time to put economics back into monetary <laughs> economics. The fundamental question that has divided economists since publication of the general theory in 1936, is whether a market economy with flexible wages and prices is self-equilibrating. The recent financial crisis should have generated a more serious debate about that question, but it takes a great deal to derail a conventional theory. As John Maynard Keynes wrote in the preface to his book, the ideas which are here expressed so laboriously are extremely simple and should be obvious. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. Well, the crisis didn't lead to an intellectual revolution. 
Instead, debate focused on the appropriate policy response rather than the theoretical basis of current macroeconomics. Indeed, the standard model taught in courses on macroeconomics and used by policymakers survived the crisis better than, di <coughs> than did our economies. But <coughs> even adding banks and financial rigidities with new first order conditions did not change its basic properties. The central idea is that the economy moves in response to stochastic random shocks around a steady state or stationary long run equilibrium. And in central banking circles, the shocks are known as headwinds or tailwinds. It is these headwinds and tailwinds which generate the necessity for monetary policy responses. But unlike most physical sciences, these shocks are unobservable, we can't see them, they can't be measured, and they are simply assumed in order to make the model fit. Moreover, they are assumed to be purely temporary in nature, thus justifying the use of monetary policy to combat them. Permanent shocks, which would require changes in the structure of the economy, and hence very different policy responses, are ruled out by assumption. Now, underlying this standard model used in monetary policy are three assumptions that cause me concern. First, interest rates are the only monetary variable in the model. Second, demand and output are for only a single commodity. And thirdly, explicitly or implicitly, there are complete markets, which when combined with the assumption of rational expectations, ignores expectations over key variables that are absent from the model, but influence behavior. I will comment just very briefly on the first two of these and focus my remarks largely on the third, namely expectations. Now, new Keynesian models define monetary policy in terms of interest rates, leaving money out of the picture. A good example of how this affected thinking was the explanation which the Fed gave for the policy of asset purchases, quantitative easing, in terms of credit easing. It seemed to me at least to be simpler to explain that the central bank was trying to replace the money destroyed by the deleveraging of the banks following the severe shock of 2008. Of course, an expansion in the money supply will affect the economy through many channels, including credit. Many of those channels reflecting the adjustment of investor portfolios are left out of the simple model. And we have inadvertently lost the richness of the discussion of money and assets, which you can find in the writings of Karl Brunner and Alan Meltzer, of Jim Tobin, and I think especially of Don Patinkin. By restricting attention to a single commodity, the model rules out the possibility that a period of mistaken judgments about the sectors in which to invest leads to what has been called malinvestment and hence the need to reduce capital in some sectors. The pace at which misplaced investment can be run down determines the speed of adjustment along an optimal path back to balanced equilibrium growth. I think we've seen much of that in the past decade. The story told by Jim Grant in his book, The Forgotten Depression, about the US downturn and recovery of 1920 to 21 is plausible because much of the adjustment required was in terms of inventory investment for which the speed of adjustment was rapid. But the mistaken investments in recent decades have distorted the structure of economies as can be seen in the excess investment in export sectors in China and Germany and the excess investment in either residential or commercial property in the Anglo-Saxon world. And I discussed this question more fully in my Feldstein lecture earlier this year. But the particular issue on which I want to focus today concerns expectations. The rational expectations revolution virtually defines when modern macroeconomics begins. The problem is that if expectations over variables outside the model are important in practice, then even models with rational expectations are inadequate. 
And where this matters is when models assume complete markets. I believe that one of the reasons why Keynes found his argument, that is, that an economy wouldn't inevitably gravitate to full employment, why he found that argument so hard to put across to classical economists in the 1930s is that the terminology of complete and incomplete markets was developed by Arrow and de Brewer only in the 1950s, some 20 years after Keynes and his critics were exchanging their views. And I shall return in a moment to an example concerning the effect of negative interest rates. But first, I want to stress the importance of radical uncertainty, a situation in which we cannot define all future states of the world and therefore to which we cannot attach probabilities as the principal explanation of why markets can never be complete. It is really striking that the two major economists of the 20th century who took radical uncertainty seriously, namely John Maynard Keynes and Frank Knight, devoted their attention to the two features of a capitalist economy that distinguishes it from a Valrhasian equilibrium of complete markets in the textbooks. Frank Knight explored the nature of entrepreneurship, something that's simply impossible to analyze outside a world of radical uncertainty and incomplete markets. And Keynes wanted to understand why a capitalist economy was subject to large fluctuations in output and employment. The clearest explanation of Keynes's view on the importance of radical uncertainty to his theory of effective demand comes not in the general theory, but in an article in the Quarterly Journal of Economics published in February 1937. Entitled The General Theory of Employment, the article explained that the weakness with classical theory was that it pretended that a world of uncertainty could be explored using the same reasoning as a world of certainty. I quote, the calculus of probability, though mention of it was kept in the background, was supposed to be capable of reducing uncertainty to the same calculable status as that of certainty itself, just as in the Benthamite calculus of pains and pleasures of advantage and disadvantage. That is, I think, a prescient critique of expected utility theory, which has come to dominate modern economics, as developed first by von Neumann and Morgenstern and later refined by Savage in Chicago. The representation of decision-making under uncertainty as an exercise of optimization has continued to exercise a fatal attraction over economics ever since the classical or neoclassical rebuttal, rebuttal of Keynes's insights. Now, Keynes had anticipated those arguments in his QJE article. I quote again, I accuse the classical economic theory of being itself one of those pretty polite techniques which tries to deal with the present by abstracting from the fact that we know very little about the future. The orthodox theory assumes that we have a knowledge of the future of a kind quite different from that which we actually possess. Now, I think it's hard to read Keynes's own words and come away, as has most of the profession, with a conclusion that radical uncertainty and incomplete markets are not at the heart of his view of the world. The distinction which people like Paul Krugman draw between two different interpretations of Keynes, between so-called chapter one and chapter 12 of the general theory, contrasting a model of effective demand on the one hand with the role of radical uncertainty on the other is an artificial one. Radical uncertainty leads to the inevitability of incomplete markets and the possibility that aggregate demand can be below its potential level. Complete arrow de Brewer markets exist only in simple models or in the imagination of a pure theorist. They abstract from so much of what earlier monetary theorists, such as Brunner and Meltzer and Patinkin, were trying to capture. And the Hicksian ISLM curve, taught to all students, is a good example. So is the modern Euler equation model of demand, to which I will return in a moment. 
And in such models, frictions are necessary to generate unemployment through either a liquidity trap, the zero lower bound on nominal interest rates, or sticky wages and prices, something which Keynes went out of his way to argue was not necessary for his presumption that you could get a weak demand equilibrium. And I think that to ignore radical uncertainty is to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But as Keynes was only too well aware, an idea which is simple and actually obvious, namely incomplete markets doesn't give you the opportunity for prices to bring about a uh, complete equilibrium, but an idea which is simple and obvious, but which is difficult to formalize mathematically, can be resisted almost indefinitely. It should be pretty obvious that in a world of incomplete markets, prices cannot adjust to ensure equilibrium in those goods and services for which markets and hence prices do not exist. This is a general, not a special case, as Hicks tried to claim. And money was central to Keynes's argument that a market economy with incomplete markets was not self-equilibrating. And I quote again from the same article, partly on reasonable and partly on instinctive grounds, because our desire to hold money as a store of wealth is a barometer of the degree of our distrust of our own calculations and conventions concerning the future, then it's possible that people want to hold their assets in a form like money, and you cannot argue then that the demand for goods and services will be in equilibrium with the potential supply. Indeed, I think you can say that money matters precisely because the demand for it can, at times, be unpredictable and highly unstable. Failure to respond to such shifts in the demand for money results in financial instability and financial crises. This is the kind of economics we need to put back into modern monetary economics. New Keynesian models assume frictions of various sorts to explain why unemployment can exist. But it was this view against which Keynes fought in the 1930s. He was adamant that even if wages were perfectly flexible, unemployment could persist, or at least low demand for employment could persist. Reductions in money wages increase desired employment, sure. But if they also reduce expectations of lower future incomes, then aggregate spending may fall and unemployment persist. Rational, or more accurately, model-consistent expectations have proved extremely valuable in avoiding false inferences about the impact of government interventions. But if markets are incomplete, it's easy to forget that expectations over future prices of goods and services for which there are no current futures markets could also respond to changes in government policies. The famous Lucas critique applies equally to incomplete and complete markets. And what has been overlooked in the discussion of monetary policy in the industrialized world today is that an argument very similar to that advanced by Keynes in respect of wages also holds for interest rates. Large and unfamiliar reductions in interest rates may generate a feedback to beliefs about future policies and hence incomes, which can offset the assumed stimulatory effect of lower interest rates in conventional models. The best illustration of this proposition is, I think, to consider the use of the so-called Euler equation in a simple one-good model of the determination of aggregate demand that was used by Marvin Goodfriend in his paper presented at last year's Jackson Hole Central Bank Conference. Implicit in the model is the assumption that all relevant markets exist and that prices can move flexibly to achieve the optimal outcome. If there are distortions resulting from either nominal or real rigidities, they can be offset by central bank actions to move the real interest rate into line with its optimal path. And the only obstacle to such optimal monetary policy is the lower bound on nominal interest rates. Now, the use of the Euler equation 
the equ equation that basically says if you sacrifice a bit of consumption today, how much do you need to get in the future um, to make sure that you're happy at the margin with your current split between consumption and saving. The use of this equation was introduced by Bob Hall in his 1978 Journal of Political Economy paper. And he showed that consumers behaving optimally would lead to the result that the marginal utility of consumption followed a random walk. And Marvin Goodfriend examined this in a simple two-period model in which consumption was proportional to exogenous permanent or second period income in which the constant of proportionality was one plus the rate of time preference divided by one plus the real rate of interest. Now, if consumers are sufficiently pessimistic about future income, then the natural real rate of interest, which equates current demand with current supply, may be negative. But such an outcome cannot be mimicked by a suitable monetary policy if the zero lower bound on nominal rates is binding. So Marvin, in his article, and his contribution to Jackson Hole last year, put great store on developing arrangements that would enable central banks to implement negative interest rates. Now, in a rare case of disagreement between Marvin and myself, I beg to differ. Central banks have flirted with negative interest rates, but for many economists, it's been a full-blown affair. Negative interest rates do indeed have a substitution effect, which raises current spending. But the move to negative interest rates may create expectations of future policy actions that would reduce incomes. Aggregate spending could fall rather than rise. Such a possibility is precluded by assumption in the standard model. And I think this is an important omission. As Bob Hall pointed out in his original article, acceptance of his hypothesis does not yield a complete consumption function since no equation for permanent income has been developed. Now, how might a move to negative interest rates affect permanent income? Well, just as Keynes argued that a cut in money wages could have an impact on expectations of future incomes, and hence spending today, so a cut in interest rates could change expectations of the future policy reaction function of central banks. Suppose that a major central bank were to announce that it had managed to overcome the technical problems of imposing negative interest rates and intended to set interest rates at, say, minus 5% for the next year, fed up with the inability to really generate a recovery they said, we've read the model in the textbook, and we know that at least minus 5% will do it. So we're going to do it. Now, that would amount to a wealth tax on monetary assets of 5%. Rather a large figure, really. Households and businesses might well respond not by spending more, but by spending less, as their uncertainty and fears about future policy actions responded to the announcement. Whatever will these people do next would be the understandable refrain. Only in the simple world of the standard model does a change in the real rate of interest have only a substitution effect on spending. And households may react adversely to negative interest rates because of the impact on expectations on future incomes. Now, I don't want to suggest that we should resist the overwhelming temptation to write down mathematical models. We all succumb to the comfort and security of a model. This temptation we might call Krugmania. <laughs> for, for no one has done more to show the power of a model that is in fact the simplest for the purpose at hand, and at the same time sufficiently complex to allow the generation of real insights as Paul Krugman. But even Krug mania has its limits. Models should be used to provide insights that carry over to more complicated worlds. Taking them too literally has led to the absurd view that measured CPI inflation between 0 and 2% represents a terrible policy failure because inflation is not exactly at 2%. Now, this is not an argument against the target or of trying to aim at 2%. 
But anyone who lived through the 1970s and 1980s will react to the proposition that because inflation is only 1% rather than 2%, this is a disaster. Those of us who experienced inflation of over 20% might think otherwise. And equally, once we recognize that expectations in a world of incomplete markets matter, then monetary policy is no longer the only policy tool that may be needed to restore a balanced growth path. Central banks aren't the only game in town. In its quest for mathematical precision, modern macroeconomics has lost touch with the crucial ingredient of earlier thinking about the causes of large swings in economic activity. Incomplete markets mean that rational expectations cannot be defined over all relevant outcomes. The simple example of the standard model or the Euler equation in which the real interest rate is the only relevant price shows that expectations over variables not included in the model can play an important part in explaining why even completely flexible real rates may not bring the economy back to a normal level of aggregate demand. Models are useful, but by their very nature, they are not the world. They are only illustrative of it. As we know, the map is not the territory. We need, therefore, a set of models rather than being wedded to only one. And I think monetary economics, rather than, more than any other branch of economics, has tended to focus only on one model. Just imagine that you had a problem in your kitchen and you summoned a plumber. You would hope that he or she might arrive with a large box of tools, would examine carefully the nature of the problem and select the appropriate tool to deal with it. But now imagine that when the plumber arrived, he explained that he was a professional economist but did plumbing in his spare time. <laughs> he arrived with just a single tool and looked around the kitchen for a problem to which he could apply that one tool. <laughs> you might think he should stick to economics. <laughs> but when dealing with real economic problems, you should also hope that he had a box of tools from which it was possible to choose the relevant one. And there are times when there is no good model to explain what we see. The proposition that it, it takes a model to beat a model is a rather peculiar one. Why doesn't it take a fact to beat a model? <laughs> and although models can be helpful, why do we always have to have one? After the financial crisis, a degree of doubt and skepticism about a number of models would be appropriate. So don't be misled into thinking that because unemployment is low today, normality is about to be restored. The crisis put paid to hopes that real interest rates might go back to something more normal. Ten-year real rates on U.S. Treasuries at the close of business yesterday were 0.35 percent, a decade after the crisis began. And the ten-year, ten-year forward rate implied by the yield structure of real rates remains below 1 percent. Normalization of our economies is still a long way off because the story of how we got to where we are is more complicated than simply an unfortunate sequence of negative shocks or headwinds. Credible and consistent policy frameworks, such as inflation targeting, are valuable, but they don't tell you what interest rate the central bank should set. That depends on observations and a theory of what is actually going on in the economy. And to do that well means that we need to put the economics back into monetary economics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, will you be able to take a few questions? Of course, of course. Let's start over here. Hi, excellent, uh, interesting speech. Uh, your uh, scenario of radical uncertainty uh, 
I wonder if you think it aligns with what we can actually measure in terms of expectations. Because time and again, what you see in terms of expectations are that they're lagging indicators, not leading indicators. So if you have radical uncertainty, <coughs> expectations rather than being some omniscient perspective on the future would be, uh, you know, well, whatever we expect is going to be something like what has happened in the past. Does, does that uh, follow from your perspective of radical uncertainty? Well, I think it does in many ways because once you accept the proposition that not in all cases, in some cases, it may be that we can use past data to calculate probabilities of future events, but there are many key events over which we simply have no idea what will happen in the future. Whether you are an entrepreneur creating a new product, you have no idea what the demand for that product will be. And there's no market in which you can sell it into. It doesn't exist as yet, but you have to make the investment decision today. Or whether it's, you know, what will happen in North Korea and what would happen if it were either deliberately or accidentally to attack Japan. These things are ideas about which we, it doesn't make sense to use the phrase probability to think about it. So in that sort of world about those events, all you can do is to try and think sensibly to create a narrative, a story, about what you think is going on. And part of that story is bound to be, well, what have I learned in the past? And so I think it's not when people have criticized in the past expectations as reflecting what happened in the past, adaptive expectations, slow moving, may actually be a very sensible, rational approach to saying, well, this is what we've learned in the past. I don't really know what's going to happen in the future. But the story I will tell has evolved out of my own personal experience. Now, the importance of that, which I think Keynes did realize and talked about, but w and it is, is highly relevant to understanding financial crises, is that if you're going to tell a story and develop a narrative, it is absolutely vital to be willing to challenge it all the time and to change your mind about the relevant story that explains what's going on in the world as events unfold. And that means you can get, if the narrative shifts at some discrete point, big changes in people's views and beliefs about the future, and hence their behavior and asset prices. And I think the events of 2008 brought home to people yeah. that what had been assumed to be a financial system, highly sophisticated, very successful, was nevertheless still exposed to the fragility of bank runs, which we maybe had thought was something back in the 19th century, but it happened today. And that changed people's views and narratives about the future, maybe made them much less optimistic about what their future incomes would be, and led to a sharp downward revision of spending, which was not a temporary phenomenon created by headwinds. It was a rational change of view about the future. And we have to work very hard to now encourage people to develop a narrative where they feel more optimistic about the future. And we probably need to implement policies that would give them reason to be more optimistic about the future. So I think that the way in which expectations <coughs> are formed I is a much more s complex matter than I think the arguments about rational expectations led us to believe. But I don't want to undermine the importance of rational expectations as making us think hard about how people will respond to government policies when they're introduced. Because that, I think, was the real contribution of it, which is if you're going to make a policy intervention, you've got to think very, very hard about how people's behavior will respond to it. And that includes their expectations of what you yourself in government will do in the future. As I was listening to your brilliant and compelling uh, speech, I was thinking, uh, in, in especially in light of your last comment, about what are the big opportunities for government uh, in light of those missing markets and the implications that come from them that, that you outlined? And the example that seemed to me to be the most obvious, and I wanted you to comment on it, is the missing market for insuring against the uncertainties related to Medicare and Social Security in the United States. In other words, if the government could resolve the uncertainties about its, its own policies with respect to those two items, seems like it could have significant effects on the growth path of the economy. W would you agree that that's an example of the sorts of things that uh, are related to your point? 
It, it is, and I think that one of the great virtues of the sort of rules-based policy framework that you were discussing earlier, it's not that one wants a central bank or any other arm of government to follow a definite rule, but you want to create a framework within which people have confidence that there's some consistency in policy. It isn't just a random selection of policy taken out of the blue. And that is fundamentally important to giving people confidence that a lot of unnecessary uncertainty won't be introduced into the system. I, I don't want to comment on you know, the, the health insurance scheme in the US versus any others. We all face problems on it. And of course, one of the things that is most significant and which we've all struggled with is that none of us can predict there is enormous radical uncertainty about the technology of healthcare and its treatment for the future, or indeed new diseases that may come along. And that's not so, that the sort of insurance that you can easily handle in advance. But it may be that there are other elements of um, disease that hits people where collective insurance can cope with catastrophic insurance in a way that it's hard to do through a market. But I do think that thinking about insurance in a world of radical uncertainty is one of the most important things that we need to do to understand both how the financial sector works, but also, as you suggested, Charlie, how government policy might respond as well. So I'm wondering whether your conclusion should make policymakers more modest or more aggressive. And so I'm thinking about the history of <coughs> Keynesian economics versus rational expectations. I feel that the way I was taught Keynesianism is it was a reason for governments to try to introduce interventions that in some ways could fool the public because they somehow could use their greater knowledge to push things in the right direction. Um, rational expectations, I thought, <coughs> was less a statement about people knowing the entire distribution of everything than a caution against the idea that governments could trick people into doing things that would be ultimately better. I'm not sure whether radical uncertainty affects markets more or policymakers more, and so I'm kind of interested in the conclusions that you draw from all of that. Well, it affects both, and I think that one of the pe peculiar aspects of Keynesian economics is if you take the basic idea of radical uncertainty, incomplete markets, the fact that the market economy as such is not inevitably self-equilibrating, that does not tell you whether you are more likely to end up with an unemployment equilibrium or a low demand equilibrium or an excessive demand equilibrium with perhaps an asset price bubble. You could get either. What it does suggest is that you shouldn't be complacent about simply trying to mimic the impact of a Valrhesian equilibrium because by definition the Valrhesian equilibrium can't exist. I think the insights of rational expectations about governments being careful about intervention were absolutely sensible because the view that there was a permanent trade-off between inflation and unemployment I think proved very damaging and rational expectations and the Lucas critique were very important in getting governments to think cautiously about what happens when they intervene. But I don't think it follows from that that we can just uh, simply assume that we won't be faced with problems of collective action. I think there are serious collective action problems in any market economy, sometimes through having excessive demand and sometimes inadequate demand. And the question of how you deal with that, I think, is not a straightforward one. And I think that I, I gave some examples as the idea that you think that just monetary policy or just fiscal policy will solve it, I don't think is right. One of Keynes's great strengths, but also one of his weaknesses, was that he was utterly focused on a particular problem at the time. So he believed at that point that expenditure on public works would help to reduce unemployment. What he didn't do was to ask himself the question, if I pursue a certain line of policy, people get used to that, what will that, how will that alter their expectations in the future and whether it will be as successful in the future. And I don't myself think that Keynes believed for a minute that the most important part of his contribution was the argument for activist fiscal policy. It was for recognizing what he thought the obvious, and so I'm so struck reading through his works again, 
he thought these ideas were so blindingly obvious because if you didn't have a Varesian equilibrium or a complete markets model, then there is no obvious reason to assume that you will ever get a self-equilibrating result. Therefore, you know, it's not an issue to be debated. And Hicks, with his elegant uh, diagrams, basically assumed a complete markets model and said only in the case of a special liquidity trap would you end, end up with a problem that we now think of as a Keynesian problem. I think it's a much more general one, but it applies on the upside as, as well as the downside. I don't think there are any simple uh, conclusions from that, um, and I certainly don't think it, it suggests that there's some, we, we should think of this as saying there's one policy instrument that will solve all our problems. It isn't. I think that we should just recognize that we will have, as a society, problems through the operation of a market economy. Not that government can intervene and make it better necessarily, but we should recognize that there will be problems uh, of excess demand and inadequate demand and work out whether there is any set of measures we can take that might ameliorate that. They will depend on particular circumstances. Do we need more questions from this side or before we move on to the rest of the room? Uh, one from Mr. Levy. So um, back when um, Ben Bernanke was rolling out uh, QE3, at the August Jackson Hall meeting, um, Michael Woodford gave a paper um, all about how forward guidance should be a complement to QE. And the Fed bought Michael Woodford's style forward guidance hook, line, and sinker, and th the ECB has done the same. Um, and weaving it back into your point about expectations and the impact of negative rates, not just the substitution effect, but al also the expectations effect. Um, what, what, what is your recommendation for these central <coughs> banks that have been relying on such policies that may have had effects that are inconsistent with what they had, they had hoped for? Well, I want to go back and link something that Atanasios said at the beginning with something that was discussed, I think, by, by Charlie and, and others of you on the first panel. Atanasios pointed out that, that the merit of something like inflation targeting was that it created a framework of discipline which is between a strict rule and pure discretion. <coughs> but the idea that you should simply interpret it as a mechanical rule where you must hit the inflation target over a precise period as judged by one particular model I think is uh, been very damaging and I recall a conversation with someone involved in monetary policy in a particular central bank n not in this country who was absolutely convinced that you could simply use the model as estimated to say well you know if only interest rates had been 0.32 percentage points lower we would have had 62,000 more jobs and I think that is taking precision to a degree that most ordinary people and most good economists will think just discredits the subject. We simply do not know enough to make that sort of statement. Now, you don't want to throw away the constraints which exist. Now, the, what Charlie and others talked about earlier on, and also in the context of financial stability, was the fact that you need to make policymakers accountable. And to do that, I think, they've got to come up with a story, an explanation of why they took the decision they did and why they think it was going to help them reach the stated objectives that they've been given by Congress or Parliament to achieve. And that, I think, is of, of, of fundamental importance. And the reason why forward guidance, I think, has run into some difficulty is that Inevitably, in terms of communication, the recipients of this forward guidance tend to interpret it as, well, if unemployment reaches a certain level, then we'll start to raise rates. Um, but, of course, that presumes a degree of knowledge that we simply don't have. And when unemployment did fall to the stated level, then the answer was, well, actually, the meaning of that level of unemployment in terms of labour market tightness is not what we had in mind when we gave the forward guidance. And I think it's a mistake, therefore, to commit to things where you know you will 
have to make changes. What it makes sense to do is to say, well, focus on today's decision. I think that the risk of forward guidance is that differences on a, on a policy committee or explanations about monetary policy end up all being about what you think you'll do three years from now or two years from now. What you want to focus on is what, what do we do this month? Why did we change rates? Why do we keep rates unchanged? And you need a story to convince people, both in Congress and the shadow and others writing about monetary policy, that said, well, this story hangs together. Well, this story doesn't hang together. That's, I think, the form of accountability that's most important. And the way to achieve that most successfully, I think, is to say, well, you know, what, are the, what have we seen in the data recently? What do we know today? What do we think will be the path of the economy moving forward with a lot of uncertainty on either side? What's the story that we can tell? And given this uncertainty and the balance of risks, that's why we made this decision. But I think the risk of saying, um, you know, we will raise rates faster or more slower is that you can't possibly know that. And it's a hostage to fortune. And it de detracts from the focus that ought to be what were the arguments that were given for this month's decision, which I think is the key thing. Uh, thank you, Paul Chi at S&P Global. Um, I'd like to pick up on the, uh, the economic plumber uh, analogy and th this idea that you know, central banks have been seen as the only game in town um, would seem to me to be very much a reflection of the, the institutional rules of the game. The fact that we've separated first the, the two elements of aggregate demand management, fiscal policy, and made that very separate from, central, uh, from monetary policy. And given really the primary task of aggregate demand management to the central banks, um, using that, that plumber analogy, it would seem to me that when the plumber arrives, the first thing you'd want to say is, what is the problem? And if the answer is, uh, we've had a, a, a big shortfall in aggregate demand, the next question would be, what tool would be the best tool to use? And in fact, what combination of tools, monetary policy, fiscal policy, maybe other tools, would be best suited to solving that problem? But it would seem to me that the framework that we have with these independent technocratic central banks being given primary responsibility for aggregate demand management gets in the way of even having that discussion of what's in the toolkit and how to deploy it. So my question to you, Lord King, is what are your thoughts about um, changes that should be made or could be made sensibly to macroeconomic policy frameworks in the light of the lessons that we've learned in the last decade or so? Well, I think it's up to the central bank to be very clear if it feels that monetary policy is no longer the answer to the problem. And there has to be a greater willingness to say we are not the only game in town and we certainly should not be the only game in town because the problem we have is the following. So uh, let me take the phrase that you used, uh, a big fall in aggregate demand, what do we do about it? What was so striking in the run-up to the financial crisis was that aggregate demand and output were growing at a perfectly sustainable long-run average growth rate in my view and the evidence for that is basically that unemployment was close to the natural rate and stable and unemployment uh, uh, inflation was low and stable too so there's no there's no real evidence from the l overall macroeconomic data that the growth rate of output or inflation were going wrong but, but behind the scene there, something very serious was going on that was unsustainable, which was the pattern and the composition of total demand and output. And after the crisis then, there was initially a problem of a shortfall of aggregate demand. The phrase that captures it best in my view is the words that Larry Summers used. He said, how do we get into this mess? Too much spending and too much borrowing. And how are we going to get out of it? Even more spending and even more <laughs> borrowing. Now, in the very short run, in the very short run, that was a perfectly reasonable argument for a Keynesian stimulus to deal with a collapse of confidence that arose as a result of the collapse of the banking system in September, October 2008. And for a period, maybe one or two years, a Keynesian stimulus was the right response to deal with that problem. But the phrase that he used, too much spending, too much borrowing, as the reason why we got into it, absolutely right, showed that there was a lopsided imbalance in the pattern of spending, 
in all major economies around the world, including China and Germany, UK, US. And that had to be put right. And that could not be achieved by monetary policy because this is about the composition of spending and output. It required changes in other relative prices and other policies, sometimes exchange rates, sometimes supply-side policies. That ought to have been the big lesson. And I think there's been too much emphasis on thinking, and this is the problem of the one model, because this imbalance in the pattern of spending and output cannot arise in a model where there's only one commodity, call it stuff. Uh, and if, if the demand for stuff falls in the model, all you need to do is to cut the real interest rate. Now, that's why I think you've got to be prepared to have a toolkit that says models are useful because they abstract from the world. We can get our head around them, and they produce insights. They mustn't be taken literally. That was the mistake of applying it in monetary policy, in my view. They cannot be taken literally. Models give you insights. But we need a lot of insights to cope with the world, and we need quite a lot of models, each one designed for a particular question. And if you think the problem is that we have an imbalance in the pattern of spending and output, then you need a different model to think about it than a model that might be perfectly adequate to deal with a different type of shock or problem. That, that's why I think we need a toolkit. So I think it's, it is a question of um, being willing to go back to what I call the economics we need to put back into monetary economics. You start with a question, what is going on in the world economy? What's going on in the US economy? And once you understood that, then you can think about which models are relevant and come up with the right policy response. Question back here. If you could identify yourself. Hi, Kathleen Hayes, Bloomberg Television and Radio. Um, you touched on how central banks ought to be more concerned about this meeting, not what's happening down the road. Do you think central banks, uh, let's take a look at the Fed, dot plots, got to let you know where I'm going, don't want to upset the bond market ever, have they turned, gone too much in that direction? I started in the Paul Volcker days, who didn't mind surprising markets at all and felt sometimes it helped make his policy steps more effective. What do you see? Well, I don't think one should set out to surprise markets all the time as a sort of game to put them in their place, no. <laughs> But, but, I, but I do think that the, the, the right thing to do is to start by saying, so what do we think is going on in our economy? What is going wrong? What do we need to do to put it right? And then tell the story as it is. If it's not the story that markets currently believe in, it's even more important to tell it clearly and to make clear that you actually have a different story in mind than you think the markets have. Now, markets are then free to accept or reject that story, and that may lead to some bumpiness. But, I mean, one of the most extraordinary things that happened, and At Atanasios will have seen this at close hand in the early days of the European Central Bank, where they were very proud of the fact that their decisions were more predictable than anyone else's. But that's because in the month before the decision, certain key words would arise in the press statement, <laughs> which basically told you what was going to happen next month. But... What's the point of that? If you've made a decision and it's news, you might as well announce it now and be, be clear. Telling the story clearly in economic terms and trying to convince economists on the shadow elsewhere that your story is a sensible one and therefore your policy decision is a good one is the way to go. And I think that everything else is a bit of a gloss on that. So I just focus on that. Uh, Guy Hazelman, Open Door Security. So I want to take your answer, Mickey's question, and Kathleen's and try and tie it together. Maybe I'm rephrasing Mickey's question a bit. And the reaction function that we're talking about is aligned with Riccardi and equilibrium. So you can't surprise markets if you have all this forward guidance. And I would say when it comes to the reaction function, forward guidance maybe works in the very short term. But when you have it for an extended period of time, it becomes very counterproductive. So maybe you can comment on that and then tell me 20 years forward, how is forward guidance as a policy tool going to be looked at? Well, since there are very few things I can predict 20 years ahead, and that's certainly one of them, I, I don't know what that will have, what, what role it will play. It, it, my, my sense is that forward guidance came into existence when nominal interest rates went to zero, 
in a world where many economists felt that money was a word they weren't allowed to use, didn't want to use, and therefore instead of talking about developments in a monetary sense, asked themselves, well, can we think of any, uh, now that interest rates are stuck, what else can we do? And so forward guidance was born as a means of trying to generate an alternative policy instrument. Now, I think th the, the problem with it is that it's not a new policy instrument. It's merely talking about what you may do in the future for the same policy instrument, namely interest rates. And if, if you appear to be not making much progress, then markets become pretty cynical about what you're actually going to do because just talking about what you might do but not doing anything creates risks of in inconsistency. And I, I think, therefore, that, again, telling a convincing story about what you're actually doing today uh, and then leaving open the question of what you'll do tomorrow is uh, likely to be more successful in the long run, and hence, I suspect, we'll come back to that in, in 20 years' time. Okay, we'll have two more questions. Uh, three more questions. One, two, three, very fast questions. Right? Um, slowly here, and then two over here. Anne-Marie Muhlendijk, uh, formerly of the New York Fed, retired. Uh, okay, my, I've been listening all through this about how the economics profession, despite all kinds of diversity in many thought, is very wedded to a m single model that is based upon a Phillips curve, Keynesian Great Depression piece. Oh, and stuff versus diversity. And you've lived in that world for a long time, and you, you and everybody else have criticized it. Why are we so stuck there? So I don't think we're stuck in terms of all central banks thinking the same and behaving that way. I think um, the, the academy has this one model which has become used a great deal and it's become fashionable and people play with it and PhD students write their thesis on it and as central banks hire the same PhD students the same views feed through. But one of the great strengths that Alan Greenspan had was the ability to start by saying well look let's, let's put the models to one side. I don't want to think about a model now. What's actually happening in the economy? And, and Alan would develop a story about what was going on in the economy. And obviously his particular flavor was to embellish the story with some obscure facts about you know, cement production in <laughs> Indiana or something. But he was brilliant at actually s asking the question, look, don't befuddle my mind with a model. What's going on in the economy? And he would talk to a lot of people and use a lot of statistics to try to work out. But he had a narrative in mind. It wasn't just that he had facts and numbers, but he welded them into a story. Then, if the model is helpful and is consistent with the story, the model may provide more insights. It may help to quantify what will happen in the future. But what Alan was very good at was, was saying, in some circumstances, the model is perfectly sensible and it, we can use it to make forecasts. In other times, particularly when in the 1990s he saw evidence of a pickup in the rate of productivity growth, which wasn't in the model, uh, then he would tell a story and say, look, let's not use the model, let's just think about the story. Now, you may agree or disagree with the policy conclusions he drew from it. That's a separate issue. But the way of approaching this um, I think was, was very valuable and we need to you know, put them together. One of the difficulties is that central banks come under enormous pressure now to make forecasts on a wide range of variables. I refuse to make forecasts on more than two variables, GDP growth and inflation. But they came under enormous pressure to publish their forecasts and views about all kinds of other variables. To do that, you need some kind of organizing model framework, a computer model to do it. Once you start to build a computer model, it becomes so complex, people want to add things to it, that it becomes incredibly inflexible. Very hard to make easy, big changes. Not e even easy to plug in and 
put in different assumptions about key variables. And it becomes something which is then a bit of a constraint for the central bank to work with. It can be very helpful and valuable, and it may be inevitable if you've got to make a forecast over a period for a wide range of variables. But it's tended to become something, a bit of a, um, a burden on central banks, I think, rather than liberating them to think about what's going on now, which particularly matters in the wake of a big financial crisis where things are happening that we don't really understand and which the model failed to predict. I think it's 2 o'clock. It's uh, time to adjourn. I want to thank... Just one more? Just one more? We'll take one more. Yes. You choose between the two who will lose out. Do we have one more question? We don't. It's 2 no, o'clock. No, it looks clearly. like... <laughs> All right, here, here we go. Thank you. Nisa Abwa, Pace University. How would you use the insights that we've learned from behavioral economics a la Daniel Kahneman in policymaking? To be honest, I wouldn't, because I think that the trouble with behavioral economics is that it starts by looking at the rational economic person of economics, um, optimizing behavior, et cetera, et cetera, and then says, gosh, people don't seem to behave like this. Therefore, they must be either a bit dumb or stupid or they're biased in their behavior. And we discover this through, there are these quirks of personality which mean that we're not able to do what we know we ought to do. I think that's a very misleading view of the world. For me, the lesson about the existence of radical uncertainty is that we cannot, in certain dimensions, optimize anything. Life is more complicated than that. It's not that we're biased or irrational. It's just that it's incredibly hard to know what it means to be rational in that world. That's why we have to tell stories to explain, work out what we should be trying to do, and always be ready to amend or adjust that story. That, I think, is a rational way of approaching a world of radical uncertainty. It's not to assume that the world can be defined by the assumptions that justify optimizing behavior, nor to assume, therefore, that people who don't behave like that must somehow have failed to have taken the appropriate economic course, and therefore they're stupid. They're not. They're struggling with a world they know is more complicated than is assumed by the model. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank Lord King, thank the Shadow Open Market Committee. And um, all the papers are on the website. All the papers are on the website, shadowfed.org. So you can read them again at your leisure. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to the next meeting uh, in the spring. Thank you, Diane.